Hello, I'm Dr. Tony Ambler, Dean of the College of Technology at the University of Houston. Welcome to the second Edison Technology Lecture Series event. Thank you for joining us. Technology touches every aspect of our lives, everything, from everything that you eat, wear, use, travel in, communicate with, watch. It is technology that has enabled the rapid creation of vaccines to confront the pandemic and how to efficiently and effectively deliver it to where it is needed. Today, you will learn about new technologies. You will be introduced to some of the programs that you can study in the College of Technology and what it is like to be a college student. We hope that you will see new career possibilities in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, or STEM. And when you are ready to select a college, we hope that you will look closely at the University of Houston. Oh, and by the way, graduates from our college have amongst the highest starting salaries. The College of Technology partners with other companies who share our passion for making sure that students graduate with the skills that will make them technology leaders. One of our most recent partners is Microsoft, and we are delighted to have Microsoft kick off our presentations. So welcome, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Sean Gallagher. I'm the Chief Technical Architect with the Microsoft Technology Center in Houston, Texas. And I'm really excited to be able to join you today virtually as part of the Edison Technology Lecture Series. I have a really exciting topic today, um, which is focused on mixed reality. And so I think that this is going to be something uh, you're going to find really fascinating. What Microsoft is doing is looking at how we can connect the world that we inhabit physically with the digital world. And I'm going to show you some of the things that we're doing from a technology perspective to enable that. So a key enabler for mixed reality is the intelligent cloud. The intelligent cloud provides distributed compute that can be accessed through mobile devices at what we call the intelligent edge. And mixed reality devices like the HoloLens, which we'll be looking at shortly, is an example of an intelligent edge device. And we're able to take all of the different sensors that we embed into the HoloLens and couple that with the power that we have in our intelligent cloud compute. So over time, uh, computing has evolved. We had personal computers, which provided access to computing power to many, but they were not very mobile um, and they had no contextual awareness. They didn't understand what was happening in the world um, that surrounded uh, the computer. Uh, we then moved to smartphones, which provided the ability to have access to compute on the go. Um, and with different sensors embedded in your smartphone, um, it provided some contextual awareness. But we're now entering this third wave of computing where we're able to take the power of the cloud bring it down to the intelligent edge and enable mixed reality devices. And this really is now manifesting in devices like this, um, which is uh, our HoloLens 2. And uh, this basically provides the ability now for me to have uh, awareness uh, both of my physical surroundings as well as have through the ability to look through the lenses here, um, the power of the world enabled through the intelligent cloud. There's lots of different technologies uh, available today when we're looking at how we're trying to bring digital and physical uh, together in the world that we, we exist in here. And there's a spectrum. Um, mixed reality sits right at the center of that where we're blurring both the physical world and the digital world together. Um, but there are other devices that you may encounter, like virtual reality devices. Um, the differentiator here is that those completely immerse you in the digital world, whereas mixed reality devices um, allow you to really coexist in both the digital and the real world at the same time. Um, augmented reality device experiences, like you may have on your smartphone, um, provide a peek into the digital world, um, but they're not quite as immersive as what you have in a mixed reality device. We're at a really interesting inflection point here where in the next five years, we may see a huge increase in how mixed reality experiences are made available. Um, this may be available in social entertainment experiences for consumers, for productivity and collaboration for people in their workplace, as well as for larger enterprises for automating and standardizing processes. 
we're still exploring the limits of what's possible with mixed reality, but some of the interesting use cases here that we've started to really see uh, uptake on are things like remote assistance to empower employees to work together regardless of physical boundaries in the world. So if someone's in Europe and another person's in the United States, they can both collaborate and share expertise through mixed reality, um, providing training and task guidance. So as I'm walking through a process step by step, I can have mixed reality um, help me through those processes by guiding me um, with mixed reality directions as well as objects showing me um, perhaps where I need to uh, place a, a tool um, to conduct a, a uh, repair, for example. Um, so there's some really interesting things here that are happening uh, in mixed reality and really just at the very beginning of it. The potential here really is massive. Um, skilling is a huge area of concern um, as new employees are coming into the workforce. It's really important to make sure that they're able to quickly be able to get up to speed on how to conduct complex processes uh, in things like manufacturing environments. And so we're seeing up to a 4x improvement on the time for an employee um, to receive training through mixed reality to be able to actually um, conduct the processes. And the, the thing with this is that you can continue to be aided by mixed reality as you're going through uh, those processes. So it's not a one-time thing where you get training with it and then um, you don't have that aid available to you. Um, one thing that's interesting is there's a lot of areas where what we call first-line workers, people that are the ones actually hands-on, um, maybe assembling a piece of machinery, they had previously not had a very easy way to access um, technology while they're in some of these locations. They just don't lend themselves well to uh, locations where a typical computer where you need to have to use your hands or use a keyboard um, may not work, that it may be too obtrusive. And so having something that's hands-free, that's able to blend in uh, with the experience as you're working on something with your hands um, really is a game changer for, for these uh, use cases. So the way all of this comes together is through a device like this. And this is the HoloLens 2 uh, from Microsoft. And this has been made to be a very comfortable device that you wear on your head. And basically through uh, the lenses here, and we, we call these uh, holographic frames, that you're able to basically uh, have the mixed reality experience. Um, and this is powered, again, by the capabilities that we provide through cloud services. So let's take a look at a mixed reality application called Dynamics 365 Guides in action. This is an application that provides hands-on learning to help workers through processes that may be new to them or maybe that they're looking to optimize. Work today is more complicated than ever. The old ways of training cannot get new employees up to speed as fast as the experienced people are retiring. We need a better way forward. Introducing Dynamics 365 Guides. Simple step-by-step -step instructions are easily written on a PC, and then holographic parts and icons are simply picked up and placed on the machine where the work is happening. From day one, employees are often expected to get work done, but the complexity can be overwhelming. Now, employees can learn by doing. This is a tool that works with existing processes, allowing a manager to get the right guides to their people. The instructions move with the employees, pointing them to the tools and parts they need showing them exactly where they need to apply them. Employees get up to speed faster, with fewer errors, and more confidence. A simple glance moves them through the instructions, meaning their hands are free to do the work. They can learn at their own pace without having to rely on other workers around them. The overall experience is comfortable and intuitive. For the first time, a manager can see detailed information about how the employees are working, 
and how their skills are growing. This makes continuous improvement faster than ever before. All of this helps employees make the complex simple so they can learn and adapt faster and organizations can stay competitive. Hopefully you found that very exciting. 87% um, of companies uh, are currently exploring, piloting, or deploying mixed reality in their workplaces. Um, and as you can see from that video, um, there's uh, some amazing things here that are possible with this. I hope that you found this um, very exciting. There's tons of opportunity as we're embarking in the world of mixed reality and we're just right now at the very beginning. Um, things like training and development, field service, geospatial planning, uh, these are all areas that are just beginning to look at what's possible leveraging mixed reality applications. And we really need help in building this future. If you're excited about the opportunity to build mixed reality applications, uh, Microsoft's working hard to create services to help developers build contextual applications for mixed reality, um, which will enable your applications to understand what's happening in the world around them and then blend that digital world and the physical world together for the user. Um, also to enable collaborative experiences. So regardless of whether you're on a tablet or you're on your phone, or you're on a mixed reality device, that all of those devices can share a common experience uh, blending those two uh, digital and, and physical worlds together. Uh, we also are trying to ensure this is done in a way that's very safe and secure. These services exist in a lot of different layers. Um, one area that's also interesting is our cognitive services. So this is where we're providing services for developers to leverage uh, AI in their applications. So things like computer vision. So allowing your application to be able to understand what it's seeing and then interpret that and relay that information to the, the user of the mixed reality application. Um, so a lot of opportunity here for anyone interested in software development. Um, I'll also note as we uh, get to a closing point here that there's also a big uh, opportunity for people that are interested in doing um, 3D uh, design, that the mixed reality applications are very similar to developing video games, um, that you need to have 3D assets or objects that you can use um, within the application. Sound is also really important. So sound design is another area um, of importance here. Um, and to another extent, also just the whole usability experience of the applications is very important here and thinking about how things work in uh, the physical world, uh, bringing digital objects into that space. Um, and so there's a lot of different areas basically that uh, you can get involved with if you're interested in the mixed reality space. Um, but again, this is just the beginning. And so really a very exciting time to uh, potentially get into a space that's just uh, getting kicked off, but has immense opportunity. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, joining me here today and uh, hope that you have a very good uh, uh, rest of your uh, lecture. All right. Thank you. Hello, this is uh, Venkatesh Balin a faculty in uh, College of Technology. Uh, we are focusing on producing uh, biofuels and biochemicals using microalgae, okay? So why microalgae? Because we are trying to use algae to fix the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. You heard about greenhouse gases. We are trying to fix those carbon dioxide using this algae. And we can produce, using those algae, we can produce fuel molecules like biodiesel and other kind of molecules, chemical molecules from this algae. So what we do is typically these algaes are found in the wild. So we try to culture them on the plates first. They grow them, we can see the streaks them, streaks on the plates. And then once you grow them, we just pick up a small colony from this plate and eventually we try to inoculate uh, the media. So basically like what we need food, the algae also need food. We just try to keep, give them enough food and nutrients 
and they just fix the carbon dioxide and then try to grow them. So here is another uh, example where we try to produce algae by growing them in this kind of tubes. We have two different algae here, spirulina and chlorella. So what we do is we try to add the inoculum with the algae inside and just start bubbling CO2. And it just, we need enough sunlight and CO2, this can keep growing and it can fix the carbon dioxide and build them as a body mass. We then harvest the algae or we process them to make fuel molecules in the lab. So using enzymes and other kind of uh, environmental friendly technologies. So here I'm going to show you a demonstration about how to take microalgae and then process them into biochemicals or sugars first and then eventually we do fermentation to produce biochemicals. The first step we have to do is we have to take the algae and we have taken already this algae in a dry form, we weighed them in a bottle and then eventually once you weigh the right amount of algae in the bottle, uh, we open this cap, we test them in small scale like 20 ml scale. So we add 20 ml of water into this and now once we finish adding the water, we use industrial enzymes. These are all commercial enzymes uh, produced by using fungus in the industry. So what we do is we just don't take those enzymes, put them in a smaller tubes like this, a pint of tubes. We just take a smaller amount, maybe microliters using this micro pipette, pipetter. So we take a smaller amount and then we just load those smaller amount into this algae solution. And once you finish adding them, we just try to close them up and then incubate this just for two hours. And this is good enough to hydrolyze all the algal cell wall into sugars. And same like what you are producing when you are taking starch and uh, when you are eating those starch, our system has enzymes to digest the starch into sugars. The same way we are doing this in the laboratory to produce sugar molecules. And that is a major focus of this lab to convert this high concentration of sugars from renewable resources like algae because algae is fixing carbon dioxide and then converting them into sugar molecules. Eventually we can take this and after we finish the hydrolysis, we centrifuge and then take them and then do a fermentation using microorganisms which can convert into chemicals and fuel molecules. I'm going to show you how we grow the algae in a growth chamber. So this is a growth chamber which has a temperature control and also with all light. We are simulating a natural environment. So we try to culture the algae and produce them in the flask and keep them in the light. So sometimes we shake, sometimes we don't shake. And this algae, we put all the nutrients in the flask and just needs the light and just keep consuming the carbon dioxide. We also externally supply CO2 into this chamber and then it can continue to grow the algae. Hello and welcome to the BTEC labs in University of Houston at Sugarland. Starting with module one, module one is a research-based module. Students will get soil samples, they will bring it back to the lab, and they will work on those samples for several weeks. Working on them with the help of TAs here, they will try to isolate bacteria, specific bacteria that is able to biodegrade. This is our second lab. We do module three here. In this lab, which contains four days, we start with E. coli growth. We would grow two liters of E. coli cells in this chamber. This chamber is controlled by a unit here. What we control is the amount of air that goes in, aspiration, and also pH temperature. Why we do that? We want the cells to grow properly. We want all of them to grow as good as possible. Then, what is the plan? The plan is to get an enzyme, which I discussed earlier, the OPH enzyme. That OPH enzyme is inside these cells. So after we grow them here, like for example on a Monday, they will grow for 24 hours, and after 24 hours, we will harvest those. Harvesting is going to happen through the hoses here. We see several hoses, several controllers, and everything is again controlled by this unit. For that, we have probes here. Those probes will read, for example, the pH, and if the pH is high or low, it will tell the machine, and the machine, with the help of pumps, can add acid or base to keep, keep the pH at a certain number that we have already told the unit. We usually harvest them in 
these bags inside these containers. They will go into the proper rotors and into the centrifuge machine. This is a big Avanti centrifuge machine. With the help of this unit, we're going to have the cell pellet at the bottom of this bag collection bags. We'll get rid of the media that was used for the growth within the 24 hours, and we'll try to keep the cell pellet at the bottom of it. Hi, my name's Barbara Stewart, and I'm representing the College of Technology Retailing and Consumer Sciences program. And I'd love to talk to you today about what you already know about retail and what the opportunities are in the field. My guess is that you already know a whole lot and have had a lot of experience with retail. For example, wave your hand at me if you like to shop. Or do you like to eat maybe? Or do you like to spend money? Or do you engage in a recreational activity that requires a field, a court, a bat, a ball, a glove that you need to involve to play? See, as I thought, you already know a lot about retail. Retailing is the number one private sector employer in the United States. One in four Americans are employed in some field of retail. It is a huge contributor to the gross national uh, product. So retail is everywhere and it's vibrant. It's growing both in dollars and in number of stores. While you might hear that some of the big retailers are in bankruptcy or are closing their doors, the reality of it is that in the next year, more stores will open than will close. Retail is doing great and offers technical and non-technical degrees and opportunities for careers. Retail's changed a lot recently. Um, as you know, online has exploded with the pandemic. At the onset of the pandemic, 90% of consumers changed their behavior. They switched predominantly to online or ship to store options. That made a mass change in the way business got done. And many consumers expect to stay as online consumers. But even while online has exploded by maybe two and three percent, uh, two or three times in some categories, bricks and mortar retail is here to stay. Probably 70, 75% of all purchases are made in bricks and mortar stores. So retail, both online and in-store, offers great opportunities. Technical opportunities, it's estimated that almost 20% of new graduates in information technology fields will be employed in retail. In logistics, in inventory management, in finance, in analytics, so the field is great. But I'd like to take just a few moments, only about three, to show you a very short video that talks about some of the changes in retail that you may have experienced as part of the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed how we function in our everyday lives. Non-essential services like retail stores and shopping centers have had to temporarily shut their doors and follow lockdown orders to slow the spread of COVID-19. But once the lockdowns are lifted and we're allowed back at our favorite stores, will it be business as usual? Physical retailers are going to have, you know, just like you see in the grocery stores today with the physical distancing signage, there are going to have to be those elements, even in small boutiques. They're going to have to limit the amount of people that can come into the store. They're going to have to re be looking at their store design. How do they handle fitting rooms? Those things are going to put a sort of a damper on um, the experiences. Along with measures like contactless shopping and curbside pickup, we may change the way we navigate. That we're going to see you know, shopping malls being one way. Food courts are going to have to have, look at their space density. You know, we won't be sitting at um, you know, the sit-up bars shoulder to shoulder anymore. And so all those space areas, all those common areas that we currently look at right now are things that we have to consider. 
E-commerce has accelerated during the pandemic. Many first-time online shoppers are also realizing the convenience of ordering goods and services from the comfort of their own homes. Behaviors may change permanently. Some will choose to do click and collect as opposed to shopping in person because the inconvenience of having to line up or um, wear a mask at the grocery store um, or at the mall is too much of an inconvenience and so it's just easier to shop online. Consumer behavior will likely change. Canada lost 3 million jobs since the outbreak and the U.S. shed 20 million in April alone, meaning people won't have the ability to shop like they used to. Some people in quarantine have reevaluated their priorities and may not feel the need to shop as often anymore. And others will continue feeling anxious about their health and safety and may not shop in person. Along with the surge in online shopping, we may also see a bump in other technologies. We're going to see an increase in adoption of augmented reality tools and applications that enable that sort of uh, close up or as close to physical as you can get shopping experience without actually having to go to the retail store. But what about the retail experience that many customers look forward to? Walking through malls, window shopping and trying on clothes. But I don't think the malls are going to go away. I mean, the malls are still the place that your some of your favorite big brands are at. Again, it's a little bit about trust and safety. And as long as they feel as though those measures are in place, that they'll be back into the malls. Hutchison says with time as COVID-19 fades, as restrictions ease, things will eventually pick up pace as we create our new technologically advanced reality. The good news is now's the time to trial and error those because the consumers might actually give you the benefit of the doubt. Walton says although the pandemic has caused many losses to the retail industry, we can also look at it as an opportunity to grow, learn, and advance the way we shop. I hope you enjoyed that video. As you can see, there's lots of innovation. Both consumers and retailers have been flexible to meet the needs of consumers during this pandemic. It's estimated that the pandemic has accelerated innovation by four to 10 years. We're seeing things change and happen faster. These changes are in the areas of health and safety, touchless retail, and distribution. For health and safety, we know that lots of consumers are concerned about being in stores right now. So we have protocols like cleaning and masks and touchless opportunities, social distancing that make consumers feel more comfortable about being in physical stores. Otherwise, they can also opt to buy online. Touchless retail is a new and growing field. You can now shop fill a cart, and exit a store without ever interacting with another individual. Touchless retail systems are currently in place and are expanding rapidly. Distribution has changed a lot. You may have had lots of things shipped to you over the holidays. In fact, the holiday system stressed greatly um, the transportation logistics, but goods arrived, Distribution centers worked. Sometimes stores were uh, converted to distribution centers. Black stores where no merchandise was sold individually to customers, but they served as points of departure for trucking, for shipping, for delivery, for the last mile to get to the consumer. Also, many third-party providers helped make up the gap in the huge onset of online delivery. Retail is vital. It's invigorating. This is a wonderful time to be involved in retail. Careers in retail abound. In fact, it's the opportune time right now to prepare for a career in retailing where you can determine the future. Because the future is about innovation and about meeting consumer needs. Retail is great fun. Thanks for talking with me. Hi everyone, my name is Avina. I'm a fourth year computer information systems student. During this segment, we will be answering questions about student life at the University of Houston, as well as sharing personal experiences we may have that will be helpful to you as you continue your education, as well as explore different careers. Now my fellow student ambassadors will introduce themselves. 
Hi everyone, my name is Andrew. I'm a sophomore studying supply chain and logistics technology. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca and I'm a sophomore studying digital media. Hello everyone, I am Alexa and I'm a senior studying computer engineering technology. Hi y'all, I'm Maddie and I'm a junior studying biotechnology. Hello, I'm Naomi, I'm a sophomore and I'm studying digital media. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah and I'm also a sophomore studying digital media. Hi everyone, I'm Evelyn and I'm a junior studying biotechnology. Hi everyone, my name is Nisha and I'm a sophomore majoring in construction management. Hello everyone, I'm a third year student studying mechanical engineering technology. Thank you ambassadors, now let's get started. Our STEM students have questions for U of H. How did you decide what you wanted to major in? So basically how you decide what to study or as we college students know is our major and what a major is your focus on what you want to do after high school and how I decided on digital media is because I really love to do creative things like film photography graphic design and a lot more and I'm very indecisive so I didn't want to just limit myself to study one focus of art um, and I also just have a lot of hopes and dreams in the creative field like my dream job is to be a creative director to work with musical artists or even traditional artists and around the time I was applying for colleges which is my senior year of high school I found that the digital media program actually offers a wide range of courses that you can take to expand your creative um skills and give you as much exposure and experience here time here the way i decided what i wanted to do or what i wanted to study was through research and extracurricular classes in high school most high schools now offer classes that let you have a feel for the profession like such as architecture hospitality public service engineering many many more classes like that i took classes such as civil engineering and architecture which caught my eye because as a child i was always interested in the quality of life for people around me and the world and like quality of life begins with shelter in which in many places of the world people do lack and i've always wanted to travel and build homes so the first step is to major in something that will show me all the steps of taking this idea and this dream and making it into reality also my father was quite a craftsman and i admire that a lot for you, I wouldn't limit myself to one area. I would definitely branch out and research what you really want to do and what makes you happy. Are college classes a lot harder than high school classes? I would say that college classes require a lot more self-discipline and time managing skills. And those two things are very important because when it comes to colleges, you're going to have multiple different professors and not every professor will do things the exact same way. You'll have some professors who give you all the due dates, quizzes and homework things ahead of time. And it's your job to keep track while you might have other professors who only give you uh, assignments bi-weekly or even weekly. So it's very much up to you to learn how to manage that time more efficiently so that you can succeed in all your college classes going forward. And it's also very important to focus more on self-discipline because that's when you're going to have to decide if that extra hour of doing video games or like your favorite hobby is worth it or if you need to put in that extra hour to study. It's also, a, uh, it also requires, college classes are also going to require a lot less memorizing and just spitting back information that you might have had to do in college or middle school, it's going to be a lot more applying the skills that you've learned because professors want to be able to teach you the skills that you're going to need in the real world and in your job in the future. It's also important to keep an open mind because in college you might not always have to do projects individually, but a lot of professors will actually require you to do group projects so that you can get familiar with working with others because no matter the industry you go into, most likely you're going to have to know how to work with others in order to be successful yourself in order to make your company more successful as well. Give me an example of something you did in class or during a job mentorship that you really liked. By far be my term project, with this, which is similar to a final exam in my distribution channels class. I collaborated with a team of four to conduct an in-depth analysis of Calvin Klein's supply chain 
And basically, in essence, what supply chain is, is how a company is going to get one good from one place to another. We conducted research over 110 countries where Calvin Klein has a presence in and monitored social media traffic on Instagram of Calvin Klein's advertising, in which we monitored 440,000 Instagram posts. We ended up getting to present our findings to an industry professional and ended up scoring one of the highest grades in the mm -hmm. course. Um, classes and like distribution channels and projects that are really applicable to my major is something I really value being a student in the College of Technology. Something fun I did in my mechanical and electric systems class was we went on a field trip to the new College of Technology building in Sugarland, where we were tasked with the job to identify machines, but there was a twist. The speakers and the professors could not help us and we had to social distance because of COVID. We had to take selfies with each machine and we also went on the roof of the building at night where we saw how the building units were run by energy units. Something fun I did in my first digital media class was again heading out towards the new technology building out in Sugarland campus. So all of our classes for digital media majors are not held on main campus. We instead head out all the way out to Sugarland and that in itself is something really amazing and different. But my favorite part of my classes are the critiques, where we get to use the huge printing and equipment for these classes. And then we go out to our own little classroom area and hold large critiques with the rest of our class and our professor. We get to put our work on display and we walk around as if in a gallery and then get to really see the differences in people's works and help each other out as students, but along with our a professor who is an industry professional and helps us out a lot in class. What do you do in college besides go to class? What's a typical day like? So most of your college career will probably be spent studying and attending class, but outside of class, U of H has so many different events and so many different clubs for students to attend. One of your classes is typically going to be on Tuesday and Thursday or Monday and Wednesday. Um, so you may have five extra days to do whatever you want. And if you're not going to study, you might as well join a club you're interested in. When I entered U of H, I joined the pre-pharmacy club because I had an interest in pharmacy. And I'd attend a bi-weekly meeting and go to volunteer events. And that's where I met all of my friends that I've now known for two or three years. Some events uh, that U of H holds annually include Frontier Fiesta, um, I believe the Greek life throws that event, so all the fraternities and sororities. Usually a musical guest is there. Typically it's a rapper or some type of hip-hop artist. They have carnival games, like the ones you'd see at the rodeo, and a lot of carnival food. U of H always has something interesting. You always have something to explore. You're never going to be bored. U of H is super vibrant. What's it like living in a dormitory with a roommate? I would definitely recommend living in a dorm with a roommate, especially if it's your first year on campus, as it's definitely part of the college experience. You'll probably get to meet one of your future best friends, and it's really nice to have somebody around whenever you're homesick or if you're far away from home. It can have its ups and downs living with somebody else, probably because you're not used to it. But my main advice is to communicate with your roommate. Over-communication is probably better than no communication at all. So talking about expectations for how clean you want your room um, and any habits you may have. So like what time you like to go to bed or wake up in the morning and even whether you like to have guests over. Um, talking about these things are really important within like your first week of living together, especially because you don't want problems to occur later on in the school year. Um, but of course, if you have any problems, you can always contact your RA that's pretty much somebody that you go to to talk about any um, concerns that you have with your living situation or with your roommate. But overall, I would definitely recommend it because having a roommate is super fun. You can always explore campus together if you're new to campus and there's so many fun events that you can go to together. If I want to go to college, what should I do? My advice for those who want to go to college is to keep your grades up. 
Um, students who usually graduate in the top 10% of their class um, are admitted to the University of Houston. And especially if you want to be considered for any academic scholarships, um, stay on top of your ACT and ACT scores and do some research and see what kind of um, scores you need to be uh, um, admitted to the college that you would like to study. Um, also explore different subjects and activities to help you decide what you would like to study. And also make sure to attend your career fairs that your school might host and try to do some personal research or even try contacting our admission office. We're always willing to help you and answer any questions that you might have. If you're interested in attending college, my advice to you is to number one, get to know yourself. You have to know what careers interest you so that you will know what direction to go into as you enter adulthood. The next thing you need to research what skills you want to build on as you enter this new chapter in your life. Number two, you also want to keep in mind maintaining a good academic standing. This is essential, but also you also want to keep in mind that extracurricular activities are an eye catcher. Colleges also want to see that you're not only book smart, but that you have good character as well. Last but not least, research your options and get to know what the colleges offer are offering you and how that applies to your interests. And don't be afraid to reach out to your mentors, academic advisors, and even your own teachers. Something I would recommend to consider before going to college is really analyzing your financial situation. Uh, make sure to notice how much you have saved, how much more you can save before college. And Maybe if you can get scholarships or which scholarships you can get, you cannot get and make sure that you have really a list or a budget in mind of how much money you are able to put in towards college. Um, because some colleges are more expensive than others and you really want to be prepared for what is achievable with your financial situation. With backing on on that, I would like to also emphasize that not always your first choice might be what you end up going to. And that's not always a bad thing. So make sure to have your first choice colleges, but also colleges that are backups for that and backups for even those colleges, because you never really know. You might like end up, you might end up liking college that you didn't think you would end up choosing at the end before your first semester. Hello, this is Dr. Sunusi from University of Houston, Department of Construction Management. I'm happy to present uh, some highlights about my program, Construction Management. Let's start first by uh, showing a short video that describes the, the program or the construction management discipline. Ever looked up at a skyscraper and wondered who built this? Hmm. An architect? An engineer? A builder? Well, yeah, all of these people play a role in designing and constructing a building. A project like this needs a team of hundreds of people and like any great team, they need a leader. In fact, a project this huge needs a whole team of leaders. Let me introduce you to a few of them. Let's say a property developer has already selected the site and decided that it's ideal for a brand spanking new skyscraper. Yeah. Where do we start? Call in the bulldozers and start preparing the site? Pour the concrete? Hold on, this is a huge project. We need to do a little planning first. So we've appointed Kim as senior project manager, Hi. the leader of our team of leaders. Kim's got years of experience in this game. She'll map out the whole process from start to finish. Who else? Well, there's Max, our design manager, who works with the architect and the engineer to design the perfect building. It's gotta be beautiful, it's gotta be functional, it's gotta be really, really tall, and it's gotta stay up. Max is pretty important. Without him on board, we could end up with a really dodgy building. Max gives the plans to Jamie, our quantity surveyor. He figures out how much it's all going to cost. It takes a huge pile of cash to build something on this scale. But without Jamie keeping an eye on the bottom line, how you doing? it could take a massive pile of cash. Jamie works closely with Steve, the construction scheduler. Hi. Steve's job is to figure out how long everything's going to take. Like, if it takes 10 workers two and a half years to build a 20-storey building, how long will it take 50 workers to build a 120-storey building? Uh, never mind. Let's just say that without Steve, it will take a really, really long time. What next? Don't we need some cranes and bulldozers? 
How about a plumber, painter and an electrician? We sure do. That's why Amy, our contract manager, is organising all the contractors. The people who do all the hands-on stuff. Hi. Without Amy, well, not much would happen at all. Now we're ready to get started. Bring on the bulldozers, pour the concrete and lay the footings. Up go the columns, in go the slabs, on goes the cladding and that's pretty much it. We just need to connect the utilities, paint a few walls, tile some floors and voila. One skyscraper delivered right on schedule. That last bit can take quite a while, anywhere between a few months and two years actually. But don't worry, Kim was keeping an eye on things the whole time, making sure everyone did their job safely. Without her, who knows where we could have ended up. What do you think? Want to join this exciting team? Perhaps you're cut out for a career in construction management. The perks? Well, the prospects are great. In 2010, 96% of our University of Newcastle students were employed on graduation. And how about a graduate salary of fifty to $80,000? But what do Kim, Max, Jamie, Amy and Steve love best about their jobs? At the end of the day, they get to say, I built this. Well, the CM program at the University of Houston offers a bachelor's degree in construction management. This degree prepares our students to be leaders and professional in the construction industry. The EM program enjoys a very high rate of placement for our students since more than 91% of our students get jobs offered before they graduate. The, the salaries of our graduates is about uh, $60,000 per year uh, when they start and we expect them to reach about $120,000 after 10 years of uh, practice. The CM program is well suited for our students, especially the ones who are working uh, during the day. Why? Because our, our classes always start from 4 p.m. up to 10 p.m. at night. And also our, uh, our, our faculty or our uh, instructors are all from, most of them are from the industry. So that this one will give more insight and more uh, knowledge about the state of the art in the construction industry. And also the program emphasizes on the practical training and the industry experience. This one will give us to our students a chance, a better chance to get employed after graduation. The CM program uh, offers two specialization. First one is commercial construction or commercial track. And this one deals with project that includes buildings like high rise building, hospitals, uh, universities, uh, parking decks, chemical plants, uh, oil and gas plants, all of that are in the process industrial uh, projects. Hello, my name is Margaret Kidd and I'm the program director for the Supply Chain and Logistics Technology Program, College of Technology, University of Houston. In this role, I manage both the graduate and undergraduate degree plan. I imagine many of you have watched the news over the last year as we've lived through a COVID world and you've heard the word supply chain or logistics. Um, in the past, I had to explain to students that came to our program, what is supply chain, what is logistics? But this is a great opportunity for us to take a real world situation and dissect it. So we know currently that back in February, when all of us went under lockdown, what was the one thing we found a shortage of? If you went to the grocery store with your parents, well, it was toilet paper or paper towels or Clorox. Well, those are all goods that are imported and folks that work in supply chain are responsible for the transportation, warehousing and distribution of goods. As we live in a global world, there's always opportunities for folks to work in supply chain and logistics. One of the unique features of my program is that our students get to have a global passport because we are one of the few programs at the University of Houston that's part of the global citizen credential. So students going through our course of study can do a couple of additional activities and when they graduate, they essentially have 
what would be equivalent to an honors cord, and they have a global passport. What is even more exciting is we have many industry partners that work with myself and our faculty and our students. They provide internships and scholarships. Your first job is not going to come from applying online. It's gonna come from someone you know. So we try to create an environment where students are exposed to our industry partners and have opportunities to network both with other students and with our industry partners. So in addition to our degree plan, students also have an opportunity to accomplish valued industry credentials. So we are partnered with the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Students graduating from our program get to apply for membership and use CILT after their name, which means they have a credential, a global credential. We also are partnered with other organizations such as the National Customs Brokers and Forwarders Associations. Students that take the opportunity to do a few certifications on top of their degree plan, make their resumes pop and will get some of the first job offers as recruiters come to our campus. What I love about supply chain and logistics is the fact that the world is your oyster. Every major company, whether it's Hewlett Packard, Dell, Apple, Exxon, HEB, for instance. They all have to hire folks for supply chain and logistics roles. So let's take something very simple, such as this plaque. As you can tell, part of it's made of glass, part of it's made of metal, then you have engraving, and then you have a manufacturing of the metal. Well, to create this particular item, someone had to procure the metal, then they had to have it shipped, then an artisan or a machine had to create this simple star, then you had to go to a glass maker and they had to cut the glass. Then all of these parts had to be moved to another location and someone engraved it. And then finally someone had to box it up. So that's, that's also supply chain and logistics. It's taking a product. It could be as simple as the jacket I have on or my pen. There's many components. And each one of those components comes from a different place in the world. For instance, the ink in the pen, okay? Or the plastic in the pen. And then you have the marketing and the distribution, supply chain. Students that complete our degree plan in their senior year also do a capstone experience. In this capstone experience, our students work in a team and partner with a local industry, okay? And so companies like KBR, Exxon, Bechtel, and even nonprofits like the Houston Food Bank, Project Cure, or Bread of Life. I am so excited to share with you that University of Houston College of Technology Supply Chain and Logistics Technology degree plan is one of the only university programs in the country to offer both the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport certifications along with the National Customs Brokers and Forwarders Associations. We are Industries University and we are Industries Toolbox. One of the most exciting projects happened this past spring with Bread of Life, which is a social services organization that provides food to needy families. Some of you might recognize the name, Jay-Z and Beyonce, they're original benefactors of Bread of Life. My students were able to help design a warehouse and inventory system to more efficiently process both people and products that go through Bread of Life. So if you're up for a real world challenge, supply chain and logistics technology is the degree plan for you. Let's write a story. One where you're the hero. One where you change the world. One research project, one business idea, one blueprint at a time. A story that starts with the University of Houston. Because we are a university of change and we're evolving every single day. We're history in the making, sculpting the future of tomorrow, one student at a time. We're forever forward, bursting with inspiration and brimming with possibility. Right in the heart of the city that sent a man to the moon. That's home to the world's largest medical center. The place that showed the world 
that even in the toughest of times, we are unbreakable, unstoppable, and undeniably better than ever. But this isn't just our story. It's yours, and hers, and his. Because here, at the University of Houston, we're still writing our legacy, and we've been waiting for you. Will you join us? Hello, my name is Cassandra Hernandez, and I am an assistant director with the University of Houston's Office of Admissions. I'm here today to give you a brief overview, not just of the University of Houston, but also the city of Houston. My hope is that after our time together, you will see that the University of Houston is a great fit for your college career. But first, let's talk location. The University of Houston is in the heart of the city, roughly 10 minutes from downtown, 15 minutes from the world's largest medical center, and 20 minutes from NASA. The city of Houston is the fourth largest city in the US and is a huge resource for our students. Houston is home to the largest medical center in the world, it's the energy capital of the world, and home to over 24 Fortune 500 company headquarters. With the help of university faculty, staff, and alumni, our location provides our students various internship opportunities, part-time employment, study abroad opportunities, and full-time employment upon graduation. The University of Houston is a large public institution. With over 46,000 students, the University of Houston is the third largest public institution in the state of Texas. The University of Houston is also a tier one research institution, one of nine within the state of Texas. U of H has been categorized as an R1, the highest research activity institution, which is top classification. This status is given to universities that are known for world-class research, academic excellence, and exceptional student body, and the highest levels of innovation, creativity, and scholarship. Why is this relevant to students? As a tier one research institution, UH provides greater opportunities for students to work with world-class faculty in nationally ranked programs and engage in cutting edge research and learning. Needless to say, our students do not have to travel far to gain experience in their fields, whether it comes in the form of research, internships, or part-time and full-time employment. The most unique aspect of the University of Houston is that we are the second most ethnically diverse public institution in the nation. We have students being represented from over 130 countries and 46 states with over 45 languages spoken on our campus. Our students not only meet people from all different walks of life, but are challenged to work with students who are different from them. The understanding that is gained by our students through diverse experiences across campus prepare all of our students, staff, and faculty to thrive personally and professionally in a global setting. Our students are encouraged to be involved and network on campus. UH has over 600 student organizations, 15 Division I intercollegiate sports teams, 100 plus multicultural organizations, 15 campus ministries. Needless to say, our campus is never quiet. There's always something for students to participate in on campus. And if you want to explore off campus, the city of Houston provides an array of activities and functions for students to partake in not far from our campus. We offer over 120 undergraduate majors comprised within our 16 academic colleges. Students have various areas of studies to choose from. With a student to teacher ratio of 21 to one, UH provides majors within business, arts, engineering, technology, science, nursing, architecture, and liberal studies, just to name a few. Did I mention that our academic colleges have nationally ranked programs? In addition to our undergraduate programs, the University of Houston also offers master's and doctoral programs for students who wish to further their education. Some of our professional schools at UH include the College of Optometry, Pharmacy, Law, and Medicine. Now that I have you all excited about U of H, let's talk about applying. Our application process is very simple. You can apply online through Apply Texas or the Common App. We do have a $75 application fee. However, we do accept SAT or ACT fee waivers. UH provides two pathways to admissions now applications to be reviewed with a test score and without a test score, which is our test optional process. Our assured admissions requirements for both paths can be found on our website. Students who choose to be reviewed with a test score will be reviewed based on their class rank and test scores. Students who choose to be reviewed without a test score will be asked to upload an essay and a resume. UH provides assured admissions for students that fall within the top 10% of their class. One important thing to note regarding majors, some of our majors do have additional requirements such as higher test scores or class requirements in high school. 
So I encourage you to look at our admissions website for more information on our majors with additional requirements. Our application opens up August 1st, and our first important deadline will be our scholarship priority deadline, which is November 1st. We do an automatic review for our Academic Excellence Scholarship for students who submit all documents needed for admissions by the priority deadline. If you wish to speak to an admissions representative, please contact our office via phone or schedule an appointment online. We would love to help make your college decision process an easy one. Thank you for watching and go Cougs! Hi, I'm Jagdeep Chada. I'm the Executive Director for Student Affairs at the College of Technology. I wanted to talk to you about scholarships. Uh, at the college, we award uh, over $200,000 in scholarships to over 200 recipients. Our average scholarship award is $1,000. And most of our scholarships are for current students. So once you become a student with us at the College of Technology, you'll be eligible to apply for these scholarships. Thanks and go Cougs! Hi, my name is Elizabeth Rodwell and I teach usability at the University of Houston. What is UX? Um, you might have heard of usability before. Um, you might have heard it through one of its um, other related terms, human-centered design. And you might have heard it by looking at some of the numerous job ads that are trying to get usability people to come to work for them. So there are two areas of UX. There's the, the research and there's the design side. And I specialize in the research side. We go out and we collect information on what people want and how they use products, and we bring it to the designers. And a user experience designer then takes that information and translates it into visual interfaces. Um, so they'll actually make the thing look good. And then I go back and I test it with people to make sure that the product actually works the way we intended. So there's a, you know, there's, there's some overlap with, at this point, computer science. Um, we see human factors engineering over in there. There's overlap with psychology and there's overlap with anthropology. So all of the social sciences, and you might have taken a, a social science related class in high school, um, really feed into the kinds of things that we talk about in my classes. Um, so if you had something, you know, a class where you talked about culture, that affects usability too. People use products differently in different parts of the world. So you can't just make a product that's going to be used, you know, one way for the US and for people in you know, Brazil or China. Some of the basic research methods that we use include personas. So personas are really sketches of the kind of person who's going to use a product. So it could be somebody like me. Um, it could be somebody like you. Maybe the persona is, let's say, 35-year-old female who's looking for information on healthcare. Um, that person has a family and wants to make sure they're all covered and they need to know how to get to that information quickly. So your job is to make sure that they can find the info they need and not be frustrated. And you have to make an app for it. So that app needs to work and it needs to deliver that info quickly. Or maybe you're trying to get people to find information on how to register for a COVID vaccination. Great, right? Um, you make an app. You're Harris County in Houston. Um, you make an app, people are supposed to download that app. That's the first problem, how to get everybody to download it. You need to know what your users are thinking, um, which means talking to people in Houston. Then once they're there, you need them to be able to find where that vaccination is happening, um, find whether they're qualified to take it, and be able to sign up if they are. Another one we use is the very fancy sounding, but genuinely really simple heuristic evaluations. Um, so this basically is going through and testing a site yourself or an app, and you're writing down what's wrong with it. We can all do this. Um, we all think horrible things about products as we're using them all the time. Um, we have, you know, apps that we love and apps that we've downloaded and tried to use and that have infuriated us and been frustrating and gotten deleted about five minutes after we installed them. And users are not forgiving. So if we try something and it doesn't work, it takes a lot to get us to try it again. Um, this is the case with not just apps, of course, but software. You know, if we hate a piece of software and find it unusable, it's going to take a lot to get us to say, sure, there's a new version. Let me try it again with my valuable time. <laughs> I've had people in my classes who have been in focus groups, and we've recreated them in the classroom. Um, 
so we've done, you know, you're helping to give your insight on a new product type of focus groups. We've had, here's an app, give us your thoughts and feelings in a group type of focus groups. Um, if you ever get a chance to participate in one of these in my class or somewhere else, they're pretty fun. We do, okay, UX people love post-it notes. We stick them everywhere. Uh, we use them to plan all sorts of aspects of the user interface and the navigation for systems. Um, but the main thing that we do in our, our line of work is we do usability testing. We actually test out these products and systems we create on people. So we have you come in and we say, here's a new app. It's gonna come out in the marketplace in six months. Try it, tell us what you think. Can you find this information or that? Or can you find nothing? Um, does it fail? Um, I have tested so many different types of apps and systems over the years with people, and most of them aren't very good when we start out, but they get better because we test them. We don't just release them out into the market. If you don't test, you release a bad product and then you have to fix it. Plus, people aren't gonna give you that second chance. We talk about design thinking in my classes, which is one of the coolest areas in tech right now. You see it in every company I've, I've ever interfaced with. Um, they hold design thinking workshops. They talk about it. They send people to conferences about it. Um, this is really people learning to think about creativity in a new way, and it intersects with usability because it helps us to think about usability in different ways too. So we do design thinking workshops and strategizing in my classrooms. Um, why does a trash can have to look like a round object, for example? Um, not every company's thought so, so that's where we get the, the really expensive OXO ones. They thought differently about trash cans after having sessions like these. When you think about things that are usable, um, what do you think about in the world of technology? Um, is it your phone? Is your phone by itself really usable? Um, what about that piece of technology makes you happy to use? What about it makes it addictive? Because we're all clearly addicted to our phones, right? When was the last time you got in an elevator and didn't look at your phone? Uh, when was the last time you were able to walk across a parking lot and not check your phone? Um, can you make it through a whole class without checking your phone? These are part of what uh, we talk about in usability. We talk about what makes things appealing psychologically to people and drives them to return to them over and over and over again. So yeah, your phone might be a great example. Um, iPads are too. I remember people didn't think those were gonna be successful, but Apple had done a lot of usability testing and they've been doing it since the early days of the OS. Um, they came out with some of the first metaphors in the world of uh, <laughs> operating systems that were really effective. So they came up with the concept of the desktop. They thought people would more easily accept a user interface if it resembled and used metaphors from things in their everyday lives. So we all are familiar with the top of a desk. They wanted to make it kind of look like and act like the top of a physical desk. So a trash can for where you throw your files. It's kind of brilliant actually. Like where are you gonna put your files if you don't want them anymore? A trash can or a recycling bin. Um, so that's the first one. But just being able to move things around on your desktop is like how you use it, use a, a physical desktop in person. And they got that really early. So they're one of the, the real pioneers in this kind of thinking. Um, but now they're not alone. There are so many companies out there that are doing really brilliant thinking about usability. So if you wanna know what makes my fridge a horrible thing, for example, my refrigerator, the worst case of usability I have seen in a very long time, um, you should come study usability with me. Hello everyone, my name is Annie Jemshed. I am a, a mother, a cybersecurity professional, and uh, also a UH College of Technology alumni. So as a cybersecurity professional, um, I, I work specifically as a lead cybersecurity operations center analyst at Schlumberger. Initially, as we started to work in the security operations center, we were working on two types of alerts. These alerts are split in two different categories, um, uh, compliance and security. Compliance alerts help us ensure that the users are following the security standards, guidelines that we have in place. 
These include and are not limited to ensuring patches are up to date on the systems, endpoint security tools are installed for visibility, etc. Uh, my team is based in Houston. We are about seven people on the team. And our primary responsibility is to uh, detect, monitor, and analyze uh, traffic on the network. As a women in cybersecurity, so male, cybersecurity is a very male uh, dominant field, uh, but being a woman, I, I come from a very uh, conservative background. I am from Pakistan, uh, and I come from a very conservative family. So I was the uh, first girl in my family to learn how to drive. I was the first girl in my family to get a degree in electrical engineering, which is considered a very technical field, uh, not suitable for women. And I was also the first girl to get a master's degree from uh, a foreign country in cybersecurity. Uh, so throughout this process, one of the biggest challenges that I have faced is uh, lack of security role models. Um, and uh, just, just being the first one in the family, I did not have the kind of support that I wish I had. Uh, my mother has always been my biggest support throughout this process. Um, I just felt that it would have been a lot easier. And I think one, that's one of the reasons that when I came to United States and when I started in cybersecurity, um, when I learned that this was also a very male dominant field, something that I was not aware of before, I actively sought uh, female mentors and um, to my surprise even though cybersecurity community itself is really small and then the women in cybersecurity even smaller um, there are still so many women in cybersecurity that will be willing to to help you and to come out and support so there are many online free resources that are out there that can help you uh, get started um, one of the things that I always tell the students is that you should have at least like a, a basic understanding of computer and uh, systems and, and network and how it works. Um, having a experience as a system administrator or network administrator is always better because you need to understand this in order to understand how to then secure these systems, right? Um, some of the entry level certifications that I'm asked about, you can always look into network uh, CompTIA, not network, sorry, CompTIA Security Plus. Um, Cybrary.org uh, is a very good resources, a resource uh, to get some hands-on training and get some uh, you know, trainings related to these different certifications that we have in cybersecurity. And it's, it's free online training that is available to students. Um, Another one that is actually going on right now is it's a free um, program that has been put together by SANS. Uh, SANS is a very, um, it's considered um, highly reputable uh, organization um, and its uh, certifications are, I mean, they're industry, industry acclaimed, <laughs> you can say, certifications. Uh, so the, the program is called CyberStart. Um, I highly recommend if you are a high school student uh, above 13 and in high school and a U.S. citizen uh, to check this out. Um, they have many challenges that you can complete and once you get to a certain level you can participate in a competition, national competition, and also qualify uh, for uh, scholarship if you're interested in cybersecurity, right? Um, for women in particular, I will recommend uh, Women in Cybersecurity. It is a nonprofit organization that aims to help women by uh, providing resources, networking opportunities. They hold annual conference uh, every year. I actually learned about this organization when I was studying at University of Houston, and I attended their conference in 2018, and my life has not been the same ever since. <laughs> Rise of Cyber Women, this is a book that was put together by uh, Lisa Ventura from UK Cybersecurity Association. This book contains uh, stories of the women that have overcome uh, some kind of adversity or challenges uh, in their life and have overcome them and uh, are doing really good, good for themselves and making an impact in cybersecurity. So I will highly recommend you to get this book, check it out. It's meant for people that feel that maybe they may not be good enough to have a career in cybersecurity or face Im imposter syndrome that makes you feel like you don't belong in a certain place. Um, so yeah, do, do check it out.
Hi, it's a pleasure to be here today. And what we're gonna talk about is something that's very important. It's about your future. It's about how technology is going to lead the way. I'm Dave Crawley, professor of practice at the University of Houston College of Technology, and my core area of focus is innovation as a skill. Uh, and with us is Caesar Wright. Uh, Caesar, please, by all means. Yeah, uh, my name is Caesar Wright. Um, I taught at Rice University uh, in the School of Engineering for many years. I co-developed the Center for Engineering Leadership at Rice. Um, I run a nonprofit foundation, the Kino Eye Center, and I've developed several programs for Microsoft. One is Microsoft Epic, which focuses on emergent technologies for K-12, so things like augmented uh, and virtual reality, esports and gaming, drones and robotics. Um, and I also created a program called Microsoft Fast, Future Accelerated Skills Training, which helps unemployed, displaced, underemployed workers gain the digital skills to find a really lucrative career and a rewarding career in technology rather than just sort of getting a job to pay the bills. What is currently evolving right now is what's called Industry 4.0, and you've seen it in everything you do. You know, you're starting to see technology in cars. There's some dynamic factors in digital media. However, within about five years or so, there's going to be what's called Industry 5.0, and it's going to change everything, absolutely everything. And the factor here is, are you ready? Because all of the engagements around business, around classrooms, around nonprofits, your personal life, even in your kitchen, is going to be inundated with technology. And you're either going to be ready for this or you're going to be left behind. And what we want to do is share with you where the industry is going and what are the key things that you need to be thinking about to prepare yourself for the emergence of 5.0 in the next five years? So uh, a few of the things that I want to talk to you about are, one is before COVID, um, the, the general understanding was that about 60% of the jobs that you will be filling when you enter industry or enter the working pl uh, world didn't exist, which means that statistically over half of you would be working uh, at jobs that didn't even don't even exist today, which to me is really exciting because it gives you an opportunity to connect your passions to a career path um, and create new possibilities, new opportunities, work on things that nobody else has ever done. Um, my guess is that because of COVID and this, this rapid transition to virtual workplace, online learning, all of these new things, um, that number is probably even higher. I, I would estimate as high as 80% of the jobs uh, that you will be working did not exist a year ago, which is a very cool position to be in. But it also requires some skin in the game. You're going to have to do the things to, to really prepare yourself and gain the skills. Um, and for those of you thinking, you know, I, I don't want to be a technologist. I don't want to be a computer scientist. That's all right. If you want to be a musician, an artist, you're, you, you, you want to work in psychology, social science, archaeology, architecture, um, energy, whatever you want to do, every career existing today, and I'll make this blanket claim, is either a technology career or it's an in tech, a technology enabled career. And what that means is you're gonna be in a position where uh, you will be either facilitating technology or leading technology. Right now, today, 74% of the world's CEOs of global companies indicate that there's a lack of innovation skills amongst their workforce that impedes their ability to be successful. Also, the World Economic Forum in the discussion of digital intelligence has indicated that there is a significant skills gap in digital intelligence, which is the ability to work with technology. I mean significant, like close to 37% or more. And then if you add the fact that 27% of the population in the workforce is going to retire over the next five years, then what you have is a community that is not entirely prepared to fully embrace the digital activities and dynamics of Industry 5.0, and that's where you come in. We're going to share with you a video from Microsoft uh, on the future of the classroom 
that incorporates many of the Industry 5.0, and this is your world. So now that you've seen the video, um, I, I hope you recognize a few things. First of all, there were a lot of really cool uh, intersections of technology and art, interface design, uh, teaching, all of these things. You know, you saw this seamless integration of all of these different technologies. And at the root of all of that is really the need for people to work together collectively in teams to have strong technical leadership, uh, to be able to work effectively together in teams to achieve bigger things. You know, by yourself, alone in your office or your dorm room, you can do a certain level of, uh, you can achieve a certain level of things. But working with a team, it's that force multiplier. You're able to do things that are just exponentially more sophisticated, complicated, meaningful. As you begin thinking about your future, there's some unique categories that you can look at. There's uh, esports and gaming. There's cybersecurity. There's digital asset management. There's video management, augmented reality. There's a lot of choices that you can go with. This is coming, and the future needs you. Well, how about that? It's amazing that technology includes all of that. Could you see yourself in college stud studying for a STEM career? We hope that this is only the beginning and that you will stay in touch to keep learning more about STEM fields. Please don't forget to fill out the evaluation form and help us to keep providing programs that will help students learn more about the College of Technology. Hopefully we'll see you next time. In the meantime, go Cougs.